fix this uh, next time I will alter the, the orientation of this. Could you help me out with this? Screen, that's it. Uh, the big you screen? Need, you need all the screen, yeah. You need one screen, yeah? One screen, this one. No, yeah. no, the big one. How, how can I... So which one was it? Yeah, there's a number. Do you know the number? No. No? When you, when you select the cinema board, mm -hmm. you need to type 1945. 1945. And this comes down? Automatic? Yeah, you press on and then it will come up there. Ah, uh, okay. One, two, three, one, two, three, I think you should be fine. You know, I think people are able to hear me. Yep. I think it should be fine. Okay. Good. Hello, can you hear me at the back? Hello, one, two, three, can you hear me? One two one two one one two three two. one two three one two three one two. This needs to be a little bit closer to, to here. No, do you think? Next time, next time uh, if I remember later on, hello, I'm hello. Okay. okay. Next time, we'll put it in that direction. Okay. Should I? Yeah. Hello, 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 hello. Ah, oh, this is better. This is better. Thank you so much. No Thank you.
Hello. Hi. Welcome to the third week. Uh, as you remember, we're going to talk about what happened to the economic growth, and we're, today we're going to go back to the Industrial Revolution. Now, whenever we want to talk about a topic, you know, whether you're presenting or you're writing an essay, I want you to ask one important question. I want you to step back and ask, why is it important to study this topic? Why study growth before 1950s? Any idea? Yes? And, and? Yeah, left behind. That is the first thing, to explore how the rich countries become rich and draw lessons from them for today's developing countries. And the, there's another reason. So the first reason, what was your name? Gaffer. 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 Yeah. As Gaffer mentioned, is to draw lessons, to find out why some p countries became rich while others failed behind. There is another important reason. Some people argue that things that happened in the 19th century, like colonialism, still have very deep impacts. So the legacies of colonialism is with us even today. So the things that happened in the 19th century still matter even today. Now, the structure of today's lecture is divided into three parts. First, I'm going to talk about the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Then we're going to see which policies did the rich countries follow when they were becoming rich. And then we're going to see what happened to the rest, the countries that were left behind. So let's start with the Industrial Revolution in Europe. Now, the first question is that when, when did the rich countries become rich? We know the start of the Industrial Revolution is, is roughly the 17, end of the 17th century, the beginning of the 18th century, uh, in my opinion, things really start to change in the mid-19th century, in the mid-Victorian era. As you can see before that, you have the income per person, 1990 constant prices of Britain, Netherlands, Japan, India, and China. There was not that much of a difference, and then we had a divergence. However, before the Industrial Revolution, we had an era of merchant capitalism. It started from re Renaissance and it lasted until Industrial Revolution. Let me talk briefly about merchant capitalism as a historical background. Now, merchant capitalism was all about trade, you know, and this was the era that first corporations were basically built, and the most well-known is the East India Company. This was effectively, uh, this company effectively had a monopoly over trade, and the merchants in this area pretty much focused on trading spices and, uh, and uh, crafts uh, and uh, small manufactured goods. So it's the era of trade capitalism. And also, interestingly, you have the birth of colonialism. So this expansion of trade went hand in, hand in hand with colonialism. Basically, the main agent, the main, the first British people, the first foreigners who entered into India were from East India Company. So there was a very, there was a very lucrative profit moment. You know, they were the main agents, the first mover of the empire. And it has a very ugly story. You know, the East India Company, I don't know, many of you have, uh, are familiar with this story. Raise of hand if you heard about the dirty history of East India Company. They have, you know, they, they have bloods in their hands. They uh, waged the wars, the opium wars in China. They toppled many governments. They waged many wars. 
And interestingly, they're still live and kicking today. You know, you can find their store all over London. You know, I know a store in Covent Garden, in Westfield. And if you go through it, it's the same old, you know, we, let's look at our spices, you know, from all over the country. And in a way, I invite you to go there because it's, it, you know, it's, if you look at you know, the variety of teas and the spices, in a way, it tells you the history of colonialism, right? So if you want to know the history of colonialism, know the history of teas and spices, you know, El Grey. Anybody know, you know, why we call the tea El Grey? It's named after a British prime minister who was active in trade, right? So, enough of uh, merchant capitalism. Let's go to the Industrial Revolution. The first, I think that the biggest, one of the biggest historical change in human history, and this first happened in the UK in the late 18th century. Now, why Industrial Revolution made Britain rich? Any idea? Why merchant capitalism was not that profitable? Why not trading was not that profitable? Comparing to selling textile goods like, you know, yes? Make the production cheaper. Sorry? Make the production cheaper, faster, and more efficient. Exactly. Make the production cheaper and faster and more efficient. Exactly. Imagine a worker in an East India company how much that worker can become more efficient year by year. Now compare that to a worker in a very bad condition Victorian era in Manchester that is producing cloths. The second worker is using machinery and is becoming more and more efficient at producing you know, clothes every time. And this is because of the machinery that person is working with. So let me get to the heart of the matter. The basic thing is technological advancements. The new technologies enabled each person to produce more goods. That is basically the heart of economic development. It is the, still the same today. What do we call the amount of goods produced per worker per hour? Yes? Linden, yes? Yeah. Productivity, exactly. The amount of output produced per worker per hour. Now, you, have, you can weigh two, two ways of measuring it. You can weigh the number of clothes that the person produced in the Manchester factory, or you can produce the amount of income that worker was generating for his boss or her boss. Okay, so you could basically multiple the number of the clothes by their price and get the income that was generating that worker for the boss every hour. Let me give you other examples of technological advancement. So this technological advancement, let me go back, happened in different eras. The first one was sewing. This was the traditional form of sewing. This is the modern form. Right. Now, this one person can produce, let's say, you know, twice as much as all of these people together in one hour. You have the same technological advancement in agriculture. This is traditional plowing. You use animals. Now, you use tractors. And that tractor is powered by steam engine. Of course, that person is more able to produce agricultural goods per hour than this person. <laughs> Traditional weaving to produce cloths. With the modern way of it in the Industrial Revolution, with spinning jenny. The productivity is much higher. Same in producing steel and iron. This is the traditional way of iron melting 
This is a modern furnace for iron melting. So we not only revolutionized production inside the factory, all these examples I told you are inside the factory. In a way, you had the birth of factory in this era. Before that, it was a small artisan shops. Now you had the birth of factory. And all these new technologies inside the factory. The same thing happened outside of factory, the transports. Now that you could produce more goods, you could transport more goods around the world. Both inside your country, the transportation inside the country, the best example is the railway that are the trains that are powered by steam engine, and also the ships that are powered by steam engine. So now that you could produce more, you have a higher opportunity to access different people all around the world and sell your goods to them. Now, the economics of it. Technological advancement has a positive impact on production output per worker. What do we call, as Lyndon mentioned, productivity. We can Calculate this at the number of clothes that a person can produce per hour, or preferably the amount of income that a person is generating for the boss. We multiple the number of clothes that are produced to their prices. Now, of course, this increases the business income, the income generated for the whole you know, business. Some part of his income goes to the capitalists, you know, the owner of the firm. And some of the income goes to the wages. The capitalists have to pay a wage to the worker. Now, the business income grows. The capitalist spends some of his profits, but then reinvests the remaining back to the factory. Better technologies, more technologies. Therefore, the, uh, this has a positive feedback on the production per worker. You got a virtuous loop. Now, the worker also becomes a consumer, right? He or she can buy the shoes that the factory is producing, or buy goods from other factories. Now, this is basically the loop of development in every country. That's just it. You got the story of economic development. It has been the same throughout history. Productivity per worker goes up. People become more productive. They generate more income for their boss. Boss gets a lot of profit, but they also have an increase in wages. They increase their spending, the boss increases the investment. And the loop goes on and on. Any questions? Now this is the lesson. Technological advancement and increase in productivity are, the, are at the heart of long-run economic development. This is still the case today. If you want to make, make a nation rich, increase their productivity. Now, let's look at the growth rates in the UK. The British Industrial Revolution, annual growth rates. This is total GDP, and this is the changes in income derived from industry and agriculture. This is before the Industrial Revolution, the growth rate is even less than 1%. Now here, where we can say the Industrial Revolution has started, the income is increasing by 1.6%, the total income, every year. Imagine your own salary increasing by only 1% per year. So the story of Industrial Revolution is a story of small betterment, 
very incremental positive changes that shows itself through three generations, hundreds of years, not in one generation. So basically, the benefits of the Industrial Revolution, all those technological advancements, took a long time to materialize. Now, at the height of Industrial Revolution, the golden ages of Victorian era, where Karl Marx talked about uh, Industrial Revolution, where colonialism was at its height, we're talking about a 2% growth rate. Very small growth rate. Even at the industry, which was at the forefront of the revolution, you had 3% gr uh, growth rates. However, having said that, small changes in growth make a huge difference in long term. Why? Because they're cumulative. Let me give you an example. Let's assume your current income is 2,000 pounds per year. Okay? 2,000 pounds per year. And your annual growth is 1%. Your income increases by 1% per year. Now, after 30 years, that means one generation nowadays, right? You're going to have kids when you're 30 on average. That means one generation. So after one generation, you end up with 2,695, almost 2,700. If, you're in, if you start from 2,000, you have a growth of 1%, you end up with this. Now, let's make a small change to the growth rate and see the difference. Again, let's assume you have 2,000 pounds. Now, this time, you have 2% growth rate. Again, after 30 years, you end up with 3,600. Very big difference with that. 1,000 pounds difference. So in the long term, even 1% really matters, right? It really matters a lot. So going back to this table, this is a very big difference in the long term. We're talking about 40 years, 2% growth rate. Okay? So imagine that although the growth rate was small, in the long term, even 1% difference make a huge difference. Okay? Everyone with me? Now, of course, as we mentioned, if you remember, with the technological revolution, you had more increasing production of output. That means more income for the boss. Gradually, things started to become better for the average wage owner, right? So as you can see, the, at the beginning, the benefits of industrial revolution was not really occurring to the worker, right? The worker was generating a lot of income for the boss, but the boss was getting a lot of income, not, not get, giving out anything to the worker. The classic case of exploitation of the worker, right? Your wages are far below your productivity. The money that you get is way below the money that you're generating for your boss, okay? Now, this is the index of wages. Bear in mind, this is index, okay? These are not monetary value. This is just changes you... Uh, this shows you the, the trend of change in wages. Now, let's look at the per capita income in the uh, British Industrial Revolution. We're again talking about 99, pr 99 US prices here, okay? We translated them to 99 prices. As you can see, uh, let's look at the 19th century. The average income was $2,000. Uh, of course, we're talking about $1990. And in the span of 50 years, it increased by only $300. And look at the life expectancy from 36 years to 40 years. Again, very incremental improvements. The heights actually reduced. This is very interesting. It's a good, good research question. Why, despite that income is going up, you know, the heights actually reduced. 
So again, the story of incremental improvement. Most of the people, we shouldn't forget, they were getting subsistence wages and living in very difficult conditions. The pace of wage growth was very small. Imagine that your income increasing 3% per year. Not a very uh, bright prospect, right? Hence, you know, the Charles Dickens talk about you know, the exploitation and child labor in manufacturing firms in 19th century London. Of course, two things always go hand to hand. When the wages for the standard person goes up, that person can spend more on clothes, more on sanitation, more on nourishment, more on food. Okay? So basically, the life expectancy starts to go up, people, the mortality goes down, and you have a population growth. With development, you have population growth. As you can see, at the beginning of 19th century until the mid of it, the population increases from 9 million to 16 million. And the growth rate is about 1%. Now, with the population growth, you always have urbanization. This is the golden rule. With population growth, you always have urbanization. There's no case in history that is an exception to this rule. A lot of newborns, you know, when they become young, they migrate from rural areas to cities in search of manufacturing jobs. They leave their families behind. Right. And this has been the story of development in almost every country. You can see it in China. If you're coming from a developing country, you just need to trace it back to your grandparents. That's simple. Right. My grandparents migrated from a rural area to an urban area. Their kids could earn a higher income and a better access to education. This is the story of development. So, industrial revolution, population growth, urbanization. No exceptions in history. They always go together. These things always go together. Now, let me show you this path by UK. Let's go to our beloved Uh, gap mine there. Let's look at UK, United Kingdom. Okay, we don't want 2003. Come on. So, we go back all the way to 18th century. Yep. Okay. Income per capita. Bear in mind, this is in a different year, right? This is why you have a different number from your handouts. It's not in 1990 prices. It's updated. So the income per person in the UK was... Can you see? I don't think you can see it in the back, can you? No. Let me try this. Better? $3,000, life expectancy 39. Okay. Very beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Bear in mind, you just had the French Revolution, the American Revolution. We're at the beginning of the 19th century. Now, let's see what happens in time. The income is really not going to the right, right? The life expectancy is changing a lot due to famines, due to natural disasters. Let's come to 8050, okay? 8054. 
5,000 income, 3,000. Not a lot of change in 50 years' time. Not a lot of change. Yeah? The UK hasn't doubled its income yet, even after 50 years. Even haven't doubled its income. So let's go forward again to 1870, height of the Industrial Revolution. To 1880. Now, the income is doubled. Life expectancy 46 from 37. Income from 3,300 to 6,000. So, the story UK doubled its income in a span of 80 years. It took UK to 80 years to double its standards. The things that many countries in 20th century achieved in just 10, 10, just 10 years. And we've got to come up to that. So the story is the story of incremental improvement. Let's go back. Now, let me talk to you about the rule of 70. This is a very useful rule. It shows you the importance of growth rate. So let's say we want to see, with the current growth rate in any economy, how long does it take for that economy to double, it, to double its income level? And the rule is 70. Let me explain to you how does that work. If your economy is growing by 1%, you just divide 70 by 1, you get 70, and it takes 70 years for you to double your income level. Almost the story of industrial revolution. Almost the story. Remember, the growth rate was not very high in the UK. It took about 80 years in the UK to double the standard of living. If you're growing by 2%, you divide 70 by 2. You get 35 years. If you grow by 2%, it takes 35 years for you to double your income. If you grow by 4%, you divide 70 by 4. It takes about 18 years. Now, China. If you grow by 10% per year, if you divide 70 by 10, it just takes you seven years to double your income. Seven years to double your income. Impressive, right? So the next time you see the growth rate of any country, you divide 70 by that growth rate and you can tell how, mo how long does it take for that economy to double its income. Now let's focus on impressive growth rate of China. Every seven year in, in China, the income is doubled. Now, in one generation, that means we have basically 28 years, right? This means that in 28 years, the income of China has doubled by four times. That means it has increased by 16 times. 16 times in one generation. And that has been the story that happened in your lifetime because of this high growth rate. So, you can see small differences in growth can have major impacts. Any questions? Yes? Why do we take 70 as a number? It's a rough, it's a rough. If you do it, we have to calculate the compound rates, basically. Right? Try to do the count, compound rates. There are many internet sites that you could just Calculus says, I have the growth rate of 3%. I'm starting from this income year, right? How long does it take for me to double my income, right? You see that the 70-year uh, rule applies to every case. 
So I would recommend to you that just do it one time by hand, calculate it yourself, and you see that the 70 rule applies to every case. Any other question? Okay. Now, as we mentioned, industrialization, urbanization, population growth, another thing changes, the structure of output, right? Industry, at the beginning of every, at the beginning of, uh, uh, every society, agriculture and raw materials are the main engine of income generating. As you industrialize, these sectors lose their importance in total income. You're relying more on industry to generate your income rather than agriculture. So what happens, the share of agriculture from total output declines, as you can see. The share of rural population from the overall total population declines from 83% to 52%. The share of agriculture employment, employment declines. More of people will say bye to their parents from rural areas, get out of the farm, and go to the factory. Same story of China today. Same pattern. Now, before mentioning this, let me ask why. Why? we see a decline in agricultural income, in share of income in any country that industrializes and become rich. Yes? Okay. But why the share, the, the share of agriculture declines? Yes. Yeah. If you have crops and stuff, you depend on other economic factors. For example, like if there's a famine, your whole you can be wiped out. So you don't want to rely on, on those factors. Plus, it's easier to add value if you're in the second sector. No. Yes. So, could you speak louder? Yes, but you don't give me the answer. Why the share of agriculture income has dropped? Let's get back to this question. I'll give you time to think about this. Let's speak a little bit about Uncle Carl. Okay? He was witnessing all these industrial revolutions and changes. And he made an interesting observation, basically a prediction. He says, capitalism is doomed. Why? Because the average person won't get the benefit, the share of its productivity. You're producing more and more income for the boss. Now, the boss doesn't give you your share. Your wages start, stays the same. And the profit rates go up. And he thought that this system is unsustainable. Why? Yes? Sorry. Eventually they realize that they're exploited and, and they... Well, let's say if they don't do this, is this economically sustainable, this system? Can an economy continue to grow where workers don't get an increase in wages, and all the benefits of productivity go to the bosses. Can this economy continue to grow? Think about our economy these days. It applies. Yes? Going back to your cycle at the beginning, wages need to spend it, and so if that doesn't happen, then yeah, there will be no, no enough spending in the economy, so spending is what drives everything. Can we have a round of applause for Safa? Thank you. Exactly. If you don't give wages to your worker, the worker is 
the person is going to spend, going to buy the products that your factory is producing. Right? Same issue with R today. Think about the growing income inequality today. Right? The, if the money income goes mostly at the top level, these guys don't spend a lot of proportion of their income. Right? So we have a lack of spending in the economy. Right? But if you give a, lot of your, a bit of your money to the poor people, they're going to spend. And you're able to sell your goods that you're producing in your factory to them. So this was the idea of Karl Marx and still applies today. When you have a growing level of income inequality in a system, the growth is not sustainable. Because who is going to spend? If the average worker is not going to spend, then who the capitalists are going to sell their goods to? However, let's look at his observations. He was writing Communist Manifesto and... Uh, uh, his most famous book, The Capital, at the time that the wages were stagnant. So his observations fitted what was going on in the economy. The worker was producing more income, generating more income, but was not getting a lot of higher wages. However, contrary to what Marx predicted, wages started to grow at the end of the 19th century. Slowly, the capitalists realize that they need to redistribute if they want to survive. They also realize that you know, all these workers that were coming from rural areas to urban areas, you know, the surplus of labor is going down. They need to compete over the workers nowadays, especially in the case of China. Imagine why wages in China is growing these days. Because that huge pool of surplus, we're coming from rural areas and ur to urban areas, is decreasing. So slowly, the capitalists have to compete over getting the labor. Now, we talked about the British Industrial Revolution. Now let's talk about the other countries that followed Britain, the followers, the late industrializers. The case of France, Germany, Russia, US, and Japan. This mainly happened in the late 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. Now, what was the most important feature of these economies? In the British Industrial Revolutions, all the machineries were invented from scratch by the entrepreneurs. It was based on innovation and invention. Now, the latecomers didn't have to invent the technology from scratch. They could just simply adopt and copy it from the UK. They just needed to go to the UK and learn a copy and learn how, copy that technology bring it over home, and learn how to use it. So this industrialization was based on technological learning. Technological learning and imitation. It was not based on technological invention from scratch. This is very important. And look at the pattern of catch-up. This shows you the income per levels. As you can see, the UK was first to industrialize. The other countries lagged behind. And then the USA caught up. Germany almost caught up. Same with the USSR. Now, this mechanism was the mechanism of the catch-up. The US copied, when it was uh, behind the UK, the latest technology from the UK, learned how to use them in their manufacturing sector, and increased its productivity at the very sp high, high pace. Now, Germany did the same thing with the USA and the UK. USSR did the same thing with the others. They went to these countries and copied their technology. So catch up on the basis of technological learning and imitation. Any questions? Now, let's look at the growth rates in these other countries. Per capita growth rates in Europe and North America. 
Now, let's focus uh, at the height of industrial revolution. You see that Germany growing at a higher rate, USA and Germany growing at a higher rate than the UK and the USSR. Yeah. Hence, they were able to catch up. Now, the case of Japan is much more interesting. A very, very late comer. It was the Western style of life. And you can see they had a very higher growth rate. So, in a sense, if you're more laggard or left behind, you can grow at a faster pace. Japan, which started way later than the others, grew at a higher pace. Just look at the growth rate in here, unprecedented in in the, in the stories that we talked about so far. 6% of growth rate. Now, I want you to talk about this question to the person next to you. Why latecomers are able to grow faster and industrialize quicker? Then, the fourth runners. You can discuss it with the person next to you. Two minutes. Why latecomers will able to grow faster? Okay, answer, anyone, yes? of the answer. They don't have to invent the wheel from scratch. They can just learn. But that's not the complete answer. 50% of it. Yes? Um, since they're imitating all the technology already created, their productivity increases. Why? Because they start to from a very based low waste point. Um, as they implement all of these technologies, uh, they see a fast but why they managed to grow faster at the time the UK was growing, at the initial stages? Yes. Yeah. Remember when UK was taking off, what was the growth rate? 2%. Now imagine a very, very late comer. The takeoff is much more faster. Why? 5% rate of income. Why? Yes? No. No. Could you speak a little bit louder and repeat it? Repeat your answer.
What's your name? Mordo. Exactly, Mordo. That was the benefit. Imagine 100 years of time, the British incrementally improved their technology, step by step. Now, when the late comer comes in, you don't imitate these technologies, you imitate the latest, right? That have improved much more a lot comparing to the technologies that the UK was using initially. So you have the benefit of copying the latest technology. So that was the rest of the 50%. Yes, you don't need to invent the technology, but you have another advantage. You can adopt the latest technology. You don't have to go and mimic the technology that the Britain was using at the beginning of its industrialization. Things have improved. What do we call this rule? The advantage of backwardness, ladies and gentlemen. It applies to the history of development. So, when we were giving the first spinning jelly to the worker in manufacturing, productivity increased by 3%. Now, if we give the latest technology by the end of the 19th century to the worker in textile factory in Japan, of course, the technology is better and the productivity of that person goes way higher. Right? The advantages of backwardness. Backward countries can easily imitate the latest technology. It's like a relationship between a sibling. You know, the older one goes through life, make all the mistakes, you come there, you learn from the mistake of the other one, and you imitate the solutions very quickly and cheaply. Okay. So, if you want to get an answer, They could promptly copy the latest and most advanced, advanced technologies and suddenly boost their labor productivity. Good. Can we have a five minute break, please? Advantage of backwardness, being backwardness. Send me an EFL if I can help. Yeah. I don't guarantee it, right? But okay. it's essentially up to you. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's you're not presenting tomorrow. No, no, no then, then you can, yeah. yeah. It's up to you to find me. Yeah, yeah? okay.
Yes. Sorry? The lectures, it doesn't show up in my Moodle. Oh, you need to talk to faculty about this. I don't, I don't deal with Moodle at all. So go talk to faculty and ask why this course is not showing up. Okay, okay. Let's go back to this question. Why, when you become rich, the share of agriculture from total output decreases? Why? Now, if you look at it, it's not just the total output, it's the employment as well. As the countries develop, and the share of agriculture in total income uh, declines, also the share of agriculture in total employment also declines. You could see in the beginning of the 19th century, 67, 64% of French were in the agricultural sector. Today is only 3%. Now, I want you to discuss this with the person next to you. Why, as you industrialize, the share of agriculture from total income drops? And let me give you a hint. The answer is here. What's the price of this? Two pounds, exactly. <laughs> Now, may I? How much of this two pounds goes to the people, this is, by the way, a can of beans, to the people who harvested these, the beans inside? You can discuss it with the person next to you. I just gave you the answer.
Share of total income. The answer is both, basically. Why, as you industrialize, the share of agriculture in total income drops? In total income drops. Now, what's the answer? Volunteers? Is that because it moves from one sector of the economy to another? Yes, but why the total share of income in agriculture drops? Yes? Could you speak a little bit loud? Uh, well, you start using a plow with a tractor in agriculture, and you need less people okay. in that sector. But you still, um, the tractor will still produce the same amount, or even more, possibly. Um, but the people working there, they're all being a different sector. Yeah. And um, this sector will grow as more people enter, and as technology advances, and output increases. 50% of the answer. The rest of it is missing. Eduardo, no? Now, let's go back to this one. What percentage of these two pounds go to the people to produce the beans inside? The agriculture sector. Less than 5%. I would say, exactly, let's, let's say about, if we be very generous, 20p. Yeah? Now, who gets the rest of it? The manufacturing sector, the people who baked the beans, processed it, put it in here, packaged in a can, most importantly, Heinz, who branded this. Get the rest of it, right? Now, imagine we want to compete with Heinz. We got a new factory called CGAA, Comparative Growth in Africa and Asia. At the beginning, we're all agricultures. We produce beans for the heights. Now, our corporation decides to diversify into more profitable areas. We say, why we should just sell beans to Heinz? We can cook the beans, process it, and sell them. So these guys, this part of the corporation, stops being farmers. They enter into agriculture. Now, what happens to the overall income of our corporation if we start to diversify from agriculture to industry? Sorry? Increases, why? Sorry? Which activity is more profitable, producing beans or baking beans and putting in the here? Manufacturing baking beans. No? Which activity is more profitable? Think about the clothes you're wearing. You're paying, um, let's say, 20 pounds for this shirt. How much of this 20 pounds go for the raw material of a cotton produced in agriculture sector? One pound, two pounds. So the people who are in the manufacturing get the cottons and produce the cloths and design this gets most of the more profit. Their activity generates more income. So imagine our corporations moved from just producing beans to baking beans and packaging it and selling them. Our income increases, right? What happens to the share of agriculture? At the beginning, it was 100%. 100% of our income was coming from producing beans. Yeah? Now, 90% of it. Let's say we decide to diversify more into this business. So rather than just this section of our business, I devote half of it to here. 
So you produce beans, you give it to these guys, they bake it, they package it, they sell it. The income increases. Which part of our business is generating more income? Sorry? The baking part. So as we diversify into more productive and income generating areas, these parts generate more income. So they become more important in our total income. The less profitable part of our business, like baking beans, like, they don't contribute as much to our income as before. So the share of agriculture drops as we industrialize. Questions? So, if manufacturing generates more income than agriculture, if you move from agriculture to industry, you gain more income. Industry gives you much more income than agriculture. So agriculture, the share of agriculture for your total income drops. Now, let's move on. As we mentioned, almost no country has become rich without undergoing industrialization. This applies to here. All of the rich countries have diversified from producing raw materials into sophisticated things. Think of South Korea, right? They were an agriculture economy. They moved to textiles. Now they're producing Samsung. So in a way, the story of development is the story that you find in Tesco every day. You move from least profitable part of the business into most profitable ones. From, baking, from producing the beans, to baking the beans, to packaging it, to branding it. Yes? From producing the cloth, and, cl cotton to producing the cloth, the cloth, designing it, branding it, and selling it. Okay. Now, what policies rich countries followed when they were growing? Second part of our lecture. There are two stories about this. One is the standard neoliberal story or the free market story. Why, for instance, the Industrial Revolution happened. You got a very capitalist story that basically Britain two, did two things. The government didn't, didn't interfere in the business. Okay. It let the entrepreneurs do the business. Also, it protected the property rights. That means that if you're an entrepreneur, you do something innovative, you earn a lot of money, I'm not a, get, I'm not a catch of money. I'll let you uh, maintain your money. So the incentive that you know that if you make a lot of profit, if, if you take a lot of risks, if the risks pay off and you become rich, you get to keep your money. The government doesn't suddenly come over and take away your money in arbitrary taxation. Now, this, according to this story, coupled with competition, right? The government says, uh, you know, you're free to compete. Everyone can enter and set up their business. You know, if you're innovative, you can just uh, get your patent, start your business, and make a lot of money. I'm not going uh, to get in the way in your business. And this... Basically, this free competition and protection of property rights lead to a lot of technological innovation. Entrepreneurs said, they, you know, they, had, they gained a lot of incentive to innovate. They knew that if they could innovate, they could get ahead with other competitors in their business and become very rich. So basically, this story in the free market story or neoliberal story uh, forces of free competition, free market competition, and protection of property rights gave an incentive to entrepreneurs in 19th century in the UK to use all the fruits of science and innovate, build good machineries, use those machineries to make more profit and become rich. Therefore, you had growth. 
Now, however, I mean, this is the story that you usually get in very, uh, you know, various documentaries. The most, you know, uh, the, uh, the most well-known documentary that follows this story is The Men Who Built America. You know, it's the story of, you know, entrepreneurs that because of forces of, you know, competition, innovated and built modern America. This is J.P. Morgan, Carnegie Mellon, Rockefeller, Henry Ford. Does anyone have any idea about the business area of these guys? J.P. Morgan? Banking, yes, yes, still survive. Carnegie Mellon? Steel, exactly. Rockefeller? Oil and Henry Ford cars, okay. However, there's a competing story. And that is mainly uh, presented by Ha Jung Chang. He's coming over to uh, SOAS next week. I don't, I don't remember. When is it? Oh, he, he, oh, did you go to the event? Yeah. Uh, his most famous book, Kicking Away the Ladder, he's basically saying that it was the other way around. Britain, France, Germany, US, and Japan, in all of these countries, stayed heavily into, intervened in the economy. It was not the story of free competition and protection of property rights. The state made a big effort to ensure that they could catch up in their industrialization, and you could you know, guess the main motive of states. What is the main motive of states to industrialize? Tax is the second one. There is another one, much more important. Sorry? If that's the second one, there's a more important reason. Warfare. That has been the main driver of industrialization in history. Defense, security, and geopolitics. Why Germany wanted to uh, catch up with the European countries because it felt insecure geopolitically. And he says out of the rich countries, only one country, that is Netherlands, follows free market policies and opened up its economy to the forces of competition in the world, you know, reduced its trade barriers. So he questions this story and he basically says that Throughout history, there has been a competing school of thought that argued for state intervention. And the most important person on this school is Frederick List. He says something very important. He says, let's go back to the point of technological learning. Remember? The followers. The key was technological learning. He basically says, learning a new technology takes time. So if you want to catch up with some industry, you're a latecomer, you want to start your textile, learning the machinery and the organization of factory takes time. So first, you need to protect your domestic industries from international competition behind high tariff barriers. And once those industries are developed, learn the technology, then you open up your economy to international competition. So this goes back to the initial point of technological learning. If you're a catch-up country, if you're a latecomer, you cannot just open up your economy and say, well, basically, foreigners can come over here, right? Like, take a lot of advantage of my cheap labor, and uh, we can develop at a high pace. To Ha Jun Chang says, that's not going to happen. Why? Because even when the foreigners come to your country for your cheap labor, you want to set up your new textile industry, that takes time. If you want to learn the technology from the foreigners, that takes time. And in order for you to learn, you, you need a period of protection and support for the government. So the government needs to interfere and protect your industries behind high tariff barriers. Then once you learn the technology, you go out and compete in the global economy. Any questions? As evidence, you can see the tariff rates, the tariff protection in all the rich countries during the 19th century, 
let's pick an example. The best one, I think, is the United States, one of the most protectionist countries. This is the average tariff rates for manufactured products. And we have about average of 40% tariff rate. Right? That means that whatever the price of product, you need to increase that price by 40% if you want to import it. Whatever the price of the product that you want to import, you need to add 40% on top of it. So it gives a huge disadvantage to the importers and huge advantage to the domestic producers. Now, the lesson is that rich countries did not follow free market policies when they were industrializing. That is basically the story. Any questions? The final part of our lecture, what happened to the rest? This is very important because some people believe that the legacies of colonialism are still with us today. Now, colonials had three important economic impacts. First was extraction of raw materials. That was it. Of course, industrialization in the core countries and the rich countries needed raw materials. And the first wave of foreign direct investment coming from rich countries to the rest were on the mining and the raw materials. So in a way, colonialism encouraged the rest to specialize in agriculture and raw materials sectors. The second was, was slavery, forced labor. At the beginning, many of these industries, the best one is sugar, was built on forced labor. And many of these labor force were transferred from Africa to Latin America by force. And the third one is creating new markets for industrial goods. Goes back to your point. Remember that when you have income inequality you know, in the rich countries, most of the profit is going to the capitalists. Who is going to spend when you can conquer other countries and open up new markets for your goods? This is a kind of a way to solve this contradiction. You go out, find new markets, new consumers for your goods, and you force them, force those other countries to consume your goods. Let me tell you, that was the ideas of Lenin. Lenin tried to answer this question, why Marx was wrong? Why, what was the factor he missed? And Marx missed the international aspect that you can go out and sell your goods to the other countries, and the capitalism can still survive. So that was his theory. Capitalism breeds imperialism and competition over markets and resources, and basically he thinks that First World War was the outcome of growing rivalry between capitalist empire, uh, empires over colonial territories. You can still think about it, China's today, they are very based on exporting manufactured goods. They are highly reliant. And they are in Africa. What are they investing in? Raw materials. What are they selling goods to? Manufacturers to African countries. It's a similar story. The pattern. This is a very interesting uh, development, you know, basically to, 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 to kind of visualize what uh, Lenin said, that capitalism and colonialism go together. This is before the height of the Industrial Revolution. This is the map of colonial territories in Africa. As you can see, most of the focus is on the coastal areas. The heartland has remained un untapped in terms of colonialism. Now let's see what happens, what is the situation right before the World War II the scramble for Africa. All the continent has been divided between these colonial powers, Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, and the rest, right before the First World War, in search of raw materials for the industrial goods and 
as raw materials for the industrial production and new markets to sell their industrial goods. Now, let's just look at this table on slavery. It's very impressive. It's, it's mind-blowing. Just compare. This is the number of slaves transported in each period. Compare these two periods together. You've got 300 years, and the total amount of slaves transported were 10 million. And in just a matter of 100 years, you got 5 million people exported. The height of slavery was 19th century. And the town that was heart of this was Bristol, basically. And many of today's bank, mainly Barclays, you know, grew up rich. Barclays Lloyds grew up rich out of financing slavery in the 19th century. Anyone from Bristol here? No? Let me skip this part and go to this. Now, we're going to talk about this in our tutorial. This is the income per person of the UK, almost similar base with India in the 15th century, at the beginning of merchant capitalism. Then they start to grow, and China and India lag behind. Now what does this tell us about the effect of colonialism in these countries, in China and India? Anyone? Or what? No, the first thing that comes to our mind is the same similar story, that the improvements of the UK went, in ha went hand in hand with the improvishment of the rest that these guys became rich at the expense of the others. However, if you, close, if you look closely at the data, we see that colonialism started really from the late 19th century, the colonialism in India and China. Before that, they were mainly in coastal areas. At the late 19th century, you had the serious phase of colonialism. So we cannot put all the blame on the colonialists. The divergence between these countries happened before colonialism. So it is not necessarily the story that the, the, that the improvement of the UK came at the expense of others. We can argue this after 19th century, at the late 19th century and the early 20th century, but the data doesn't support this before that. Yeah. So colonialism has not, not all, we cannot blame everything on the white man, basically. Of course, it had a lot of negative effect. Let me tell you about India, for instance. When the British came to India at the beginning, at the beginning of 19th century, they had a very flourishing domestic manufacturing sector, the textile sector. Now, the British forced the Indians, to open up their economy to the textile produced in Britain. And that destroyed the domestic manufacturing sector in India. This is a very interesting stat. By the eight, 1873, about 40, 45% of British textiles were exported to India. This led to the destruction of Indian textile industry. So the lesson is economic development of rich countries went hand in hand with underdevelopment of some other countries. Like, okay, let's not blame everything on the white man. Okay. Some countries remained underdeveloped because of the legacies of colonialism. And we're going to talk about these legacies throughout the course. However, not every colonized country suffered from low growth. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and most interestingly, Korea and Taiwan. 
Look at the growth rates in Korea and Taiwan during the early 20th century, at the time that they were colonized by Japan. Very impressive growth rates. So the studies show that actually, when it comes to economic growth, Japanese were very good colonizers. They built a lot of industries, a lot of infrastructure. So the point is to show you that the story of colonialism is a very diversified story. It's not a homogeneous story. It changes case by case. Now let me summarize the content and finish the lecture. First point, technological advancement and learning is at the heart of long-run economic development. It, that applied in late 19th century. It still applies today. Second, almost no country has become rich without undergoing industrialization. You diversify from not very profitable businesses to profitable businesses, which is from, manufact from, in from agriculture to industry. The third one is the rich countries did not follow free market policies when they were industrializing. The state heavily interfered and encouraged the industrialization. And finally, economic development of rich countries went in ha hand in hand with underdevelopment of some other countries. We cannot blame everything on the colonialists. Thank you. Oh.